If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we'd ask that you would turn to the book of 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 3, 1 Samuel chapter 3, while you're turning there, we uh, always covet your prayers as your pastor and as a preacher that the Lord would lead us in the right directions uh, to lead the church. 1 Samuel chapter 3, and we're going to begin reading in the very first verse, 1 Samuel chapter 3. In the first verse, the Bible says, and the, and the child Samuel ministered before uh, ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. And it came to pass at that time, when he and when Eli was laid down in his place, and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep, that the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here am I. And he ran unto Eli and said, and said Here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I called thee not, lie down again. And he went away, and he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again, Samuel. And Samuel rose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for thou didst call, thou didst call me. And he answered, I call not, my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. Neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am. For thou didst call me, and Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be that if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for another day, another opportunity to be in your house on this side of eternity, Lord. We give you the praise for that. Lord, we thank you for your word that lies before us. We pray that it would always be a living word unto us, Lord, and that we might understand and know its teaching, get something new from it every time that we look in. God, we pray that you would bless your word to the hearts of the hearers. We'd be faithful to give you the praise and glory and the honor for it all. For it is in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. We'll be preaching this uh, morning on the thought on some uh, precious things here. Some precious things that we find in the Word of God. Uh, some precious things that's all about us and we miss them day by day, hour by hour, and we never look into the precious things that God has provided us. Now, uh, we really almost lost the meaning of what precious precious is, uh, but it means rare and good. And apparently in the days where these people lived, there was very little good things going on to understand what precious is. Now, uh, uh, when I was a kid, my mom sometimes, and uh, we go see a new baby around there at Carlisle, and she goes, oh, ain't she precious? And I always thought that was odd that she called call him precious. And mom would say, well, if they're not pretty, you got to come up with something. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but that's not the meaning of precious. Precious is rare. It's a jewel. It, it's something to be looked for and to be protected and to take care of. And that is what the Word of God is today. You know why we have so many versions of the Word of God in the English language? No one finds it precious. If you're willing to get in and mix, mix up something that, that is the uh, precious Word of God, you don't find it precious. You, you don't find it unique. You don't find it valuable. And so then by man's hands, you're willing to really do what you, whatever you want to with it. And that is the day that these people live. Now, going back to the first verse, the Bible says, And the, and the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord. Now, I want you to notice a couple things about that, because if you know your Bible, you know this is the promised child of Hannah. Uh, she said if she would just have a son, she'd give him 
all the days of his life into the work of the Lord. Now, if you know uh, the story, she nursed him and nurtured him and, uh, for the first three years of his life and then left him down at the temple from evermore. Now, you look at this little girl here, Sister Brenda's grandchild, great-grandchild. That's about the age of a child that he took. Now, can you imagine giving that child away at three years old? You know why she did it? Because her Lord was more precious to her than anything else. Mm -hmm. See, you don't find that very much anymore, do you? Uh, where, where what God wants preempts what you want. Uh, you, don't, you don't find that very much. But Hannah was obedient, and she did what she was promised. And if you know the rest of that story, she, God blessed her with five more children besides Samuel. And, and so Samuel is taken down and left there to serve the Lord. Now, I want you also, it said that he ministered unto the Lord. Now, listen, you can be here and you can show up and minister unto the Lord and not be saved. Samuel didn't know God. He knew about God. And you know, I, I really believe in the modern day, that's where most of people are at. They, they know about God, but they don't know God. Right? Mm -hmm. they, they've never experienced Him coming their way and cleansing them of their unrighteousness and making them a new creature in Christ. They just have not got that. And Samuel had neither, but you know what? What I admire about Samuel and I admire about lost people that continually to come to church, you know what? They're ministering. Yeah. They show up. They, you know what? <clears throat> I've seen more, some more some lost people be more faithful to the house of God than people who say they're saved. And, and so we find then that Samuel was there. He was abiding where he was supposed to be. And the word of the Lord, uh, middle of that verse, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. Now, you look at this book before you this morning, and then you find it precious and precious indeed. Because this book is the holy living word of God. What does John, the first chapter of the gospel of John says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Now, that is to be reverent. That's what that means. This book, and it's a good old Bible. My youngins had it rebound for me. I, I about wore it out. But it wasn't saying this book was, was, but it was saying that this is to be reverence that way. You know when the Bible teaches you to do something, you, you, you look at it as God told you to do it. Not, not as simply reading words. Uh, this, this is the very living word of God. And in the days of Eli and Samuel, apparently it was very precious. Well, look about us today. How many people do you really think regard this book as the very living word of God? Few and far between. So it's precious, is it not? Is it, is it not precious that people still respect this word for exactly what it was, what it is? And the child Samuel, uh, and the child Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days, and there was no open vision. Now, don't get uh, hung up Pentecostal on me uh, on open vision, because I'll refer you back to our text, uh, the text in John 1. He says it was a living word. Have you ever picked up that word and gleaned one thing and then maybe a year or two later read the very same passage and glean something new? You know why that happens? It's a living word. It is an active word. It's something that ministers to the Spirit. And apparently in the days of Eli, it wasn't going on. Now I'll tell you why Eli was compromising. And he's, eventually his neck got snapped because of it. See, you don't pretend God. You don't go through a faith. You don't show up just to be show up. E e either you love him or you don't. Mm -hmm. Either you know him or you don't. Now, Baptist doctrine is good and I love it. But you know what I love even more is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what? If I wasn't a member here and if I, if I wasn't in one of the Lord's churches, my salvation would be what's precious to me. Mm -hmm. Because you know what? He didn't have to do that. He came and poured his life's blood out for his own glory and for his own honor. Right. And, and so we find then 
that apparently the days of Eli are just like our days. There wasn't much true preaching going on. Now, you may have had your little Sunday schools and you may have had, uh, uh, remember, and it's very close to this text, they said, preach us smooth things. We, we, uh, you know what the flesh likes? It likes it easy. It really does. It likes it smooth, no bumps in the road. But you know what? What I have learned, serving Christ is just not like that. And, and so we find then that Samuel comes up in a difficult day. Verse 2. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down to his place and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. Now, I believe Eli was truly going blind, just like with a visual context. But you know, people are spiritually blind today. They just don't get it. That's it. And, and you know what? Uh, we wouldn't either if it wasn't for the goodness of God. You know? And if he didn't take the blinders off, listen, you'd be just as blind as the next one. And you know what? You'd be you you jump on the sin train because that's the direction this flesh will take you. So you know um, what the first fruit of the spirit is? Love. You know what? When we get so centered on being right about everything, you've lost the spirit of love. Mm -hmm. If you can't go up to somebody, listen, you can't go up to somebody and start teaching them five points. No. You tell them about the goodness of God and you leave it there. And you know what? If, 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 if that would be a seed and if it, it plants it uh, first up or to lay there and die, that's what the Bible says. And so what we need to do is just simply sow the seed. And so Samuel lived in a very, very difficult age and he became a servant for Eli. Verse 3, and ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord. In other words, before it was even good night, time to go to bed, uh, where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep. And the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here am I. Now, when, when this voice came across and said, Samuel, he said, Here, I, here am I. Now, there was another individual that did the same thing, and that was Moses. Uh, here am I. You know, you know what the problem is today? No young men are saying that. Nobody is available for the ministry. Nobody is available to preach the gospel. Yeah. You know, this, this is my own belief. I don't believe in a general call, call to preach more, no more than I believe in a, a general call to redemption. But, I believe there is some calling that's not going that that people are not responding to. And you know what? They'll get themselves in a big mess that way. If you don't believe me, read the book of Jonah and you'll find out how that thing goes. And so we find then, as the Lord's people, that we live in a day very much unlike the days of Eli. And he's spoken to by the Lord, and he doesn't know who it is. And he ran, verse 5, and he ran unto Eli and said, Here I am. For thou calledest me, and he said, I called not, lie down again, and he went and lay down. Now, we're not going to rehash all of this text, but remember, he does this three times. Mm -hmm. Runs in there, and then the Bible says concerning Eli, that he finally says, it might be the Lord speaking to him. Now, shame on Eli, right, that it took him three times to get it. You know, I believe more than his eyes were dimmed by this point. I believe because of his, the sons of yeah. his, the right. sins of his son, Halfanah and Phinehas, that uh, he got his heart dull too. He, he wasn't plugged in. You know what? You be very careful what you, what you allow your children to do. Don't overlook it. Because, see, if they don't learn to be obedient to you, they'll never learn to be obedient unto Christ. Right. Uh, and, and so we find that this was the case here, that he was unplugged. And so he finally says, the next time he calls you, you say, here am I. I want to read verse 7, and then we'll move on. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The, uh, and Samuel did not yet know the Lord. 
Do you know the Lord? Uh, if you leave here this morning, remember this one thing and ask yourself continually, do I know the Lord? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's one assured thing I can say to you this morning, yeah. that I know the Lord because he came and introduced himself to me as a 12-year-old boy. Wasn't nothing good that I had done. He manifested himself to me because of his goodness and his grace. And he get and, and, and he made something more he made a new creature out of something that was nothing. That's what salvation was. And we find that Samuel has a very real experience. And after that, he's serving all the days of his life. And in fact, this very message, he, he, he says, listen, you go back and tell Eli that the, that the gig is up. Israel's going down. His first message was a message of destruction. Right. And you know what? It said, the, 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 the only preacher, you understand this, Eli was afraid to preach it. <laughs> mm -hmm. He said, well, what am I going to tell him? But you know what? Eli was faithful. And, I mean, Samuel was faithful. Amen. And he went in, and you know what Eli said? Thou hast well said. <laughs> See, yeah. uh, a real saved person will, will take it. It may not sound good to the flesh, but they'll take it in. Right. And, and it, wasn't long, it wasn't long after that, uh, half and on Phinehas was dead, and it was just as the preacher had spoken it. And so we find then that we need the Lord. You know what? I don't know what's going to happen in the election. You know, I, I'm so sick of hearing about it. And you know what? Whoever God wants on the throne is the one that's going to be on the throne. And I don't need to stress about it. But what I want to hear is God's people speaking the name of Jesus. You know what? We live in a world where, where they want us to be ashamed of the goodness of God. Yeah. And they want us to be ashamed. Me, me and Brother Kenny was talking a while ago. And, uh, you know, most people would call us a cult. They really would. When, when it impacts your life, such as the women dressing like women and men dressing like men, and, and, and not talking like the world, and not blending into the world, you're labeled as a cult. Mm -hmm. Not only are you labeled by the cult, by the world, you're labeled as a cult by the government. And so I want you to see that we, what we should, we shouldn't focus on that, but rather than us just focus on serving the Lord and the Lord will take care of the rest. So we see that that's where we as the Lord's people ought to be. Now go with me to the book of uh, uh, 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 18. And we'll see how you are to use some precious things. Uh, time is very precious, and you'll learn that more and more as you get older, and you find that you spend your wills most of the time. 1 Kings 18 and verse 27. 1 Kings 18 and verse 27, the Bible says this, And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullet for yourselves, and dress it, uh, for ye are many, and call upon the names of your gods, but put no fire under. And they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it, and, and called on the name of Baal from morning unto evening, saying, O oh, Baal, hear us! But there was no voice. Now listen, there's no voice in false gods. And they're out there wherever you look. And listen, I'm not talking about running and worshiping under trees. I'm not talking about going before a statue called Buddha. I mean, idolatry is worshiping something that is not the truth. Right. Now, it is man's nature to want a simple answer to sin, is it not? Right. Now, we know the first sin was in the Garden of Eden, and... What was Adam and Eve's answer to sin? They sewed them some little twigs together, a little fig, and, and they half dressed. And God came unto them and he said, Where art thou? Now listen, don't ever mess this up. He wasn't, he, he knew where they were at locally. He wanted them to know where they were at. And that was outside the realm of the will of God. Yes. And then what had to happen next, 
something had to die in their place, did it not? Yeah. Now, we don't know what those skins came from, if they were from sheep or goats. I, I have no idea. But something died to take care of the problem. And you know what? This morning, the Lord Jesus Christ died to take care of your problem. Amen. And it's still the blood. And so we find then that this young man, I mean, uh, uh, that Elijah was addressing the bailers, verse 27. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he, for if, if he is a God, for he is a God. Either he is talking or, or is pursuing or he, or he is in a journey or a peradventure he sleepeth. In other words, he was making fun of their false gods. And you know what? Uh, that's looked on critically today. And, and certainly, I would try to not make fun of people. But on the same time, why would you serve a God that's trying to do something? Yeah. Do you ever know anything in the Word of God where God tried to do something and it wasn't accomplished? I don't. Not a one. You know what? That's because he is sovereign and Amen. he can get the job done. If he can split the Red Sea open, he can pretty much do anything he That's wants right. to. And so we find then that these Baalists were worshiping and worshiping and worshiping and wasn't getting anywhere. What wasn't heard by God in any way. Now, drop down to verse 31. Uh, then Elijah was going to show them who God was. And Elijah took 12 stones, that's one for each tribe of Israel, I believe. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes and the sons of Jacob, whom the Lord, whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar as, as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order. Now I could preach all day on that. And he put the wood in order. In other words, the worship of the Lord needs to be orderly. And he cut the book in pieces and laid him on the and laid him on the wood and said, Fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Now, the reason I point this out, what were they in? They were in the worst drought known to Israel ever. You know what gets real, real precious when there's a drought? Water. In fact, nothing is any more precious. See, the Lord Jesus is going to ask you to use some precious things sometime. Amen. You know what man likes, what mankind's natural pull is toward money. You know what? He's going to ask you to use it sometime. Second thing that man really enjoys is things. Cars, trucks, houses, land. We like that, don't we? Mm -hmm. You know what? He's going to ask you to use them one day. And so we find this very special commodity in, in a day when literally the dust was blowing. And he says, get me four barrels. And they dumped it on there. Notice what happens next. And he said, do it again. Do, do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, do it the third time. And they did it the third time. Now, so now we have 12 stones and 12 barrels of water. And the Bible says that, that little, those little ditches they dug were plumb full of water where they had uh, dumped that barrel. Now, I don't know exactly what a barrel holds in, in uh, the Jewish measure, but for us, it's 50 gallons. So by this point, he had put 600 gallons of water and dumped it on that place. And uh, by the way, six is the number of mankind. And so we see all that water dumped in and we're gonna see what God does. He says, hear me, O Lord, hear me. And, and that, these, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and thou hast turned their heart, and, and thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell down and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. Now, you know, it was, it was a very difficult thing to give up that much water, wasn't it? It was a sacrifice. 
but they heard from God, did they not? Yeah. So it was very precious. We, we read the text in First Samuel. The word of the Lord was very precious in those days. Mm-hmm. You know, look around this room. What is it, maybe two, a dozen of us, maybe? You know what that is? It isn't necessarily that the Lord's not blessing us. It's because the Word of God is precious. And most people want something else. Mm-hmm. They want to be entertained. They, they want uh, somebody to tell them how good they are. They want them to tell them how, how easy it is to be saved. They want them to tell all these crazy things. But you know what? That ain't what the Bible says. Truth is a precious, precious thing. This morning, I'm not here to tell you how great you are. I'm here to tell you how great you need Christ and and to genuinely be saved. It's a precious thing. Now, go with me to Ecclesiastes. Uh, Ecclesiastes 12, very familiar verse of Scripture. I'm going to read one verse, Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and the first verse. The Bible says this, Solomon writing, Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, when the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Now, the, the, the text says, remember the Creator in the days of your youth. Now, listen, you may be healthy as a horse, but hard times are coming. I'm not as healthy as I was when I was 20 years old. I could do a lot more then than I can now. And you know what? I'm very thankful for what I can do. But listen, just being honest, we're not the men we were 30, 20 years ago. We're a different people now than we were then. So the wisest man that ever was, and listen, by this time he was in old age. This was his last letter to his people. He says, do it while you're young. Do it while you're young. You, you, you know uh, why I think this young man wants to preach? is because he's going to do it while he's young. And he doesn't. The very best what years of your life to serve the Lord is about 20 to 40. And I, and I say that from, from self-experience. And it's not that you can't do it after then, but listen, uh, things start to hurt, don't they? Things go a little slower than they once did. So we need to remember the Creator in the days of your youth. Now, if you will, go with me to the book of Psalms, uh, chapter uh, number 90. And all my uh, regular church people know this is my favorite psalm. Uh, It is the only psalm that I know of that was written by Moses. Um, Psalms 90. And uh, for time's sake, we'll drop down to... Uh, verse 8. Psalms 90 and verse 8. The Bible says this. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee. So God knows. Our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. Very scary thought, is it not? For all our days are passed in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. Mm. The days of our years are three score years and ten, which is seventy. And if by reason of strength, they may be four score years or eight. Yet is there la- yet yet is there, meaning in those years, yet is yet is there strength and labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knoweth? the power of thine anger. Even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days, Uh, that we may apply our hearts unto the wisdom. Now, uh, Sister Abigail is new, and I haven't got to pick on her yet. Uh, Her birthday was yesterday, day before? Friday. Friday. All right. So, young lady, you are 8,037 days old today. And according to my math, you got about a third of it behind you. Pretty scary thought, isn't it? Pretty scary thought. And so, what are we going to do to serve the Lord? 
that precious time that we're given, set into uh, remember the Creator in the days of thy youth. Yeah. Why it's precious, why it's good, and uh, then you can be used in a strengthened way unto the Lord. Remember the Creator in the days of thy youth. And so that's one thing we can use, and, and why it's precious, why the time is here, use it unto the Almighty, and use it for Him completely. In the New Testament, in Ephesians chapter 5, now this is the uh, uh, church letter to the church at Ephesus, and to the best of my understanding, probably Timothy was their pastor, and uh, Paul was writing to them and to Timothy about some things. It, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 14. Uh, Ephesians 5 and verse 14. The Bible says this, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee a light. Now, my personal opinion is he was writing to a church, so that was a group of saved folks, and he's saying, awake. Now, what that says to me, he wasn't saying, you know what, when, when you're saved, you're called to life. When you say, wake up, you're saying to somebody that's alive there, get up and do something. You know, uh, uh, Joey's either awake all the time or he wants to sleep all the time. And you get in there and sometimes you have to do like this and rub on his chest a little bit to get him going and awake, get up. And so Paul was writing to the Ephesus church, why are you asleep? Well, I can tell you why the church was asleep. There was sin in the camp. There, there were problems there. And you, you know why churches fade off the scene? Because there's problems there that don't that go unaddressed. And, and, and that would take the life's blood out of the church. And, and so we find that the church in Ephesus, he says, wake up. See that you walk circumspectively, not as fools, but as wise. Now, he says, well, you walk circumspectively. In other words, you look around. Uh, a circum or a circumference is a, is a circle, and you go around like this, and he says, you check it out real good. You be sure things are where they ought to be. You know what? There's not one of us here this morning, if we did a good circumstantial uh, inspection, we couldn't find something wrong with ourselves. Right. Now, I've never been in the military. Brother Junior has. But I understand, especially for new privates and stuff, new uh, recruits, when you, when you get dressed and you stand at attention, they come and they walk around you. They want to be sure everything's in place, everything's where it's supposed to be, that you're neat, you're presentable, your uniform looks like it ought to be, and that is, and you know what, we're on an inspection every day. He's looking at us. He knows about wasted time. He knows about wasted energy. He knows all about us. And so Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus, and he says, wake up, get up, uh, look at yourself, know where you're at. Verse 17, wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding the will of the Lord, what the will of the Lord is. Do you know the will of the Lord for your life? Uh, very important that you do. You know, I really believe, I don't believe that the Lord saves folks just to sit there. Do you? Mm -hmm. I, I don't believe that. Right. I believe He saves folks to the work that He's given them to do. Right. And what they need to do is do it. And, and so, he, uh, Paul says, huh, what is the will of the Lord? What, what are you supposed to be doing? You as the Lord's people, what is your ministry about? And are you about the Father's business? Verse 18. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, meaning drinking too much will get you drunk, but be ye filled with the Spirit. Now Baptists sometimes choke on that one, don't they? But listen, brother, it's in there, and we need to know about it. And you know what? I know I ain't the only one. Have you ever walked around and just felt so empty? You hadn't heard from God in so long. You hadn't heard from the Lord. And, and it's always because of us. You know, don't ever get that wrong. But see what I, I believe today, people are, are fearful 
of looking within and seeing what the problem is. You know, when COVID started up a few months ago, that's when I was having those issues with my heart. And I, I ain't going to say the doctor's name, uh, but he's a good, good cardiologist. And, and I trust him. I really do. Work with him a lot. And uh, he came in and he looked at me and he asked me some questions. And I thought, well, he's going to break the stethoscope up in a minute. He asked me a few questions, and he said, Larry, I'm going to order some tests. And he walked out of the room. And I thought, well, I may be half dead and not know it. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I can't even tell you what my insurance give him for doing that. You see what I'm saying? But the Lord is not like that. He's going to look at you real, real carefully. Mm -hmm. He's going to give you an assessment that you can depend on. Mm -hmm. And see, what we don't always like about assessments, the next time I went to see Dr. Uh, <laughs> the doctor, he, uh, he listened to my heart that time. And he gave me some news that wasn't that good. You're going to probably need either uh, some stents or bypass. Mm -hmm. And you know what? That, that, I went, Whoo! You know, that, that wasn't a pew day, was it? But, I'm glad he was honest with me. Mm -hmm. You know what? The, the most precious thing, remember we started about talking about truth in the beginning. The most precious thing is truth. Now, I had to do some things after that, and the Lord healed me from most of it. Mm -hmm. But, when you know the truth, you're responsible. Yeah. Once you know the truth, you're responsible. And um, we need to be that kind of people. When he gives us something to do, we need to do it. Yeah. You think back to the time uh, when Jesus saved your soul. What, what an elatement that was. What a wonderful thing when he came down and made you new and all that burden of sin rolled away. Well, we need to focus on that time and think about what we've let back in to hinder us since that time. Because I, I know there is. There's every one of us that does that. You know what's about the best barometer uh, of where you're at spiritually? Are you anxious to go to church? Or do you feel a responsibility to go? Now, if you're anxious to go and say, hey, you know what? We might hear from God today. Mm -hmm. And, and you get down here anxious and, and you're not really about worried about the meal that we're bringing. You're like, well, you know, Diane, just cut us some bologna off and we'll be good. And you get down here with the anticipation that you're going to hear from the Almighty. Now, if that's where you're at, you're in good shape. Mm -hmm. But, if you go, well, you know, I'll go because I know Larry will give me that eye if I don't. Right? You know what? You're going to leave here drier than you got here. And so we as Lord's people, we need to use precious things. Listen, the Word of God is the most precious thing. We should take it from Dover, Tennessee to Egypt if we have the opportunity. Because you know what? Everybody else is doing it. Every kind of foul, ungodly teaching. And not, not, not just pagan people, not just Buddhists. People that go in the name of Christ and selling a lot. Right. That's the most tragic it is, is it? Oh, all you need to do is be baptized, let me dunk you. Yeah. You know, and then they'll go out through the rest of their life thinking that they have something. Yeah. You don't think that that's not real? Remember <coughs> when it speaks of the day of judgment? He's, uh, there would be some saying, Did I not prophesy or preach? Did I not prophesy in thy name? And look at him and said, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Right. Pretty. And you know what? That deception goes also to people who sit on the pews of the Sound Baptist Church and split hell right away. Mm -hmm. You know what? They're deceived. Mm -hmm. People don't like to hear, listen, there's nothing you can be do to be saved outside of the mercy of Christ. Right. They do not want to hear that. They want to tell you, you can do this, and you can do this, and voila, you're saved. Dear friend, I won't tell you that lie. But I will tell you this, seek the Lord while you may be Amen. Amen. That's it. Because that's 
what the Lord burdened my heart with. And you know what? He came to me and he made something out of me. What about you? Do you have that this morning? Mm. Do you understand and know the person of Christ?